very much, Phil. You have a very exciting event going on here this week, and I have to remember that I'm here this morning to talk about my favorite subject, which may not be yours, which is economics. <laughs> and coming onto the stage after that nice intro, I'm reminded when the word economics first came into the vernacular of my family. I was a New York City math and science student, and I ended up um, going after college back to the University of Pennsylvania to Wharton. And back in Brooklyn, my mother was asked by my nephew, her nephew, um, and Miriam, why is Paul back in Philadelphia? I thought he just graduated. Did he do something bad? And my mother, having learned a new word, said, no, my son Paul is going to be an economist. And my cousin said, and Miriam, what's an economist? And that threw my mother, because it was a new word, and she said, I think an economist is someone who is very, very, very good with numbers. But does not have enough personality to become an accountant. <laughs> so as we're going to spend a little time here talking about economics, let's hope my mother's definition does not uh, come true. And let's hope talking about economics this morning helps you start to see your business and your role in our society and in your business life. The reason I became an economist was growing up in Brooklyn, it was so clear to my immigrant father and his brothers who were in business with him that no one knew anything about economics, yet economics dominated 95% of their waking lives. Every day was how to get a job, how to get a better job, how to buy a car, how to finance a car, and of course the ultimate dream for an immigrant in Brooklyn, how do you move to Long Island or Westchester to buy a house, and how do you finance a house. And I noticed whenever they would talk about economics, they would argue and nobody agreed. So I said, they really don't know. I'm going to go figure out, once I found out there was this subject called economics, I didn't know that in high school, I switched and I became an economist because I was brought up feeling so fortunate that my family was living in the United States and I wanted to bring home to them the knowledge that they clearly knew the most. And I've had an amazing, amazing career as an economist at a very young age, ending up in the White House, ending up as assistant to the CEO of the Citibank for five years, got introduced to everybody, and had an amazing, amazing career until I was 41 years old in 1995 when I had an epiphany that said I wished I had stayed in science and math because the world doesn't need economics, the world needs something else. That epiphany occurred when I was giving a speech at was then the RCA Dome, 60,000 people in Indianapolis. And as I'm the keynote speaker, and I usually like to do, I put on a baseball hat and for a few hours before I walk around, not that anyone would recognize a keynote economist anyway. <laughs> and, I, and I asked if I did the last uh, 20 hours here, going up to individuals like you, saying, why are you here, what do you hope to get out of it, do you know who the speaker is tomorrow, what do you think he's going to talk about, and I'm trying to, you know, honestly feel what you're trying to, be, what you're trying to learn here. And as I walked around this crowd in Indianapolis, it was absolutely shocking to me, because these people were so overweight and so unhealthy, and when you talk with them, you can figure out by their dress or some conversation, they're probably about 35, but they look 55. And this was just not my reality. I had a beautiful place in Soho next to NYU where I taught. I had a beautiful beach house in the Palisades. And when I would fly back and forth, not land in the middle, between my two upscale communities, it was as if I'm living on a different planet. So I came home and I said, why would people spend time and money to go to a weekend retreat, pay money to learn about economics when it's clearly the most important things they learn, learn to do first? They either learn how to eat and take care of their health before they learn about economics. And where does this disconnect occur? And then I started studying obesity and economics, and I've since written four books on preventative medicine. I coined the word wellness almost 20 years ago in one of those books, The Wellness Revolution. Wellness, when I started, was meant cancer care. It meant the hospice care for cancer patients was a wellness center. And I grabbed the word wellness and took it back, as I'm going to explain to you today. And as I started studying this, it got very depressing. And I said, I don't know enough biology to know what this is about. And this is a terrible, terrible crisis. What I figured out, and I'll use today's numbers back then, it was 50% of the population was overweight and obese. But it wasn't just a random 50%. They all lived in certain areas. They fit a certain social demographic profile. In one of my early books, I talked about the poorer you are, the more overweight you are. And the New York Times said, how ridiculous is this rating that they like to say whatever president you're with if they don't like you. Um, how ridiculous is this Reagan economist who now says that poor people 
are more overweight than rich people, and everybody knows poor people have no money to buy food. I mean, that, that was the thought 20 years ago. And of course, as I started studying it, I started realizing it's so much worse than it looks out there. Then it was 50% overweight and obese. Today, it's 65%. And it really, in our new millennium, here we are in the 21st century, just think what the world was like when we were born. I mean, I, 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 I shudder to think of the life my parents grew up in Eastern Europe, where most of their family died in concentration camps, or my wife lived in a refugee camp and came to America you know, as a young child as a refugee from Vietnam. And I look at the world, and I go, look at the lack of discrimination. We have an African-American president. I mean, these are amazing times we live in. And yet, we've replaced the racial and gender discrimination of all of history with a new type of discrimination based on your weight. A person walks in for a job, walks in to get a date, walks in for a marriage, walks in for anything they want to do, and their weight and health, particularly the weight, define their social and economic opportunities. This is painful stuff. The same way your family name, birth, color of your skin, or race did only 50 years ago from since the beginning of time. And as I explained earlier, in the past where poverty was associated with thinness, Today, poverty is un associated almost worldwide with an overweight who operate, who operate on the lower rungs of economic ladder. When I was young, I used to laugh. I used to say, what do you want to be, Paul? And I'd go, I want to be a rich, fat man. And it was like that image of the capitalist is going to make money and do all these things. A rich, fat man today is an oxymoron. And poor and fat have become synonyms. So these were the numbers in 1980. They've doubled since today. And what we really stand before us is there are 314 million residents, Americans, living in the United States. And of the 314 million, think of that number, 204 million, 204 million are overweight or obese and not enjoying the fruits of their economy that their parents and grandparents and they probably worked so hard to enjoy. My life's been defined by the Cold War. My father's from Russia. I spent several years in the Soviet Union working for President Reagan, and I'm leaving the stage tonight to go work with the Chinese government in China. And yet, when I look at the world today, I see the Iron Curtain that Churchill talked about in terms of the lives. What would it have been like living in an Eastern European bloc country, as I'm sure many of you have? I mean, you couldn't decide where you want to live. You couldn't dream of getting a better job. You couldn't go date somebody out of your class or network. Couldn't dream of getting married to the person who might be in love with. It was a pretty bad life. And yet, I look around today at the people who are overweight, particularly obese in this country, and they live the same life as if an iron curtain had descended on 65% of our population. So I got into this and I said, gee, this is terrible. I'm now into emotionally what it's like to be obese. I'm a writer, researcher, I go talk to people, and I'm collecting all my data points. And I wish I knew biology. I wish I knew how their body got to be like this. How do I learn about this? And then I found out, wow, it's pretty cool I'm an economist because it's economics that caused the obesity and overweight in the first place. It's the rules of economics of the food industry and the medical industry that have brought us to this precipice, it really is, where we spend $3 trillion a year, three times what we spend on all public and ed private education in this country on sickness care, which is really entirely obesity care. Economics is to blame for our diet because 1.5 trillion of our economy, so let's talk about economy, you have about 15, you literally don't use slides because I want you to remember the numbers. We have about a 15 trillion dollar economy, 15,000 billion, that's output, new, new growth each year. It's a really amazing number. And 1.5 trillion, 10% of it, is the food industry. And I worked in the food industry. As an economist who wrote papers on statistical analysis, I got called in by General Foods, Procter & Gamble, and General Mills at different points in my career, and hired as a professor to help them analyze economic data. Mia culpa, I am one of the people guilty in this because when I watched them thinking what they're doing, my job was to run the numbers, but it was sort of like being in a place, I said they shouldn't be doing these things. Because these packaged food companies follow the great unwritten law of marketing. When you are under the gun to sell a product, it's much easier to sell more of your product to an existing customer than go find a new customer. 
In any business, it's much easier to sell more to an existing customer, it doesn't sound logical, <laughs> they already got it, than to go find a new customer. So what does that mean? It means that most packaged foods companies operate in what we call a potato chip marketing equation. A potato chip marketing equation says that 10% of the customers who buy potato chips of your brand consume 90% of your product. Easy number. But think of it. You might buy one bag of potato chips, nice big bag, last year month, and you take a little bit out each day, put a few chips next to a sandwich or some kind of garnish. Or you might buy one bag a day and eat it in front of them. You see how fast it is? That's 31. So you very quickly see that everybody has these high consumption customers. And these high consumption customers are like rats in, in a laboratory. They study, oh, they go to this church and the new song and praising Jesus is this one. Let's hire the singer of the song for our commercial. So they subliminally hear the commercial and associate our music with what they are, our item in the church. And they put together, study their likes, dislikes, hopes, dreams, heroes, aspirations of a high consumption customer. And everyone's a little different, but they've got some product they're effectively emotionally addicted to. No expense is spared. If you're a high consumption customer of McDonald's, through General Foods, through Procter & Gamble, any type of Pringles, any item, you are like a deer in headlights. You've got the best and brightest minds getting up every day, studying everything in your life to make you consume more of that food. And they mix the chemicals in a way that's unbelievable. I've seen glass rooms where they take cookies like Oreo, which by the way, used to be Kraft Foods, became Philip Morris Tobacco. They literally took the tobacco market people and same company and moved them over to the food companies. And they made these Oreos and these cookies so when the child eats 30, 35, 45 cookies, 55, and then says, Mommy, I don't want any more of this cookie, they go fix that to the chemist. Don't you ever give me a cookie that a child tells me he doesn't like the taste. You want some proof of this? Uh, suppose you never tasted a banana. So I come over here, I should have a banana on stage, and I throw, uh, open, I throw you a banana. And you go, what do I do? You buy it, it's terrible. I go, no, you gotta peel it. So you peel the banana. <laughs> Never seen one before. Think about it for a moment what it tastes like. It's amazing. Wow, how would you describe the flavor of a banana? So you eat the banana, and then I go, here's another, sure, and you eat the second banana. Now we actually think this in your body. What happens on the third banana? You want a third banana? No. Isn't that funny? You've never had anything so absolutely amazing in your life. So I take out an orange, and I throw you an orange, and you buy it, it's bitter. No, you gotta peel it. So I show you how to peel an orange. <laughs> Pretty amazing. And then you eat the orange. Wow, I give you a second orange. You want a third or a second? Same thing with an apple. Isn't this amazing? You never had it before, and after two or three, what's going on? God gave you a body that says, you've had enough potassium, you can not go for the vitamin C in the orange. <laughs> It's, it self-regulates itself. So our bodies are built to always want to get a variety, we know, of vitamins and minerals. And of course, what happens now? You go to McDonald's and have a French fry. Which French fry are you sick of? Is it the third? <laughs> Is it the 50th? And what kind of, so why? Why? It's because they processed and made the French fry to fool your taste buds. It actually tastes better and better the more and more and more until you're sick of it. And wow. they've effectively filled this with empty calories. Empty calories we use up to 2,000 whatever calories you can consume each day that don't have the vitamins, the minerals, the proteins that you need to live. And I remember once when I was doing some analysis and I went up to General Foods, and every used to mention these companies, but I mean, they're old now, I'm a lot of talk about anyone and their all clients and <laughs> companies don't even exist. And I said to the head guy in the main meal division, having trouble with the data, can I see some of the videos? Because there's video behind these focus groups, behind one-way mirrors. He goes, you don't want to see those, Paul. And I said, no, I want to see what they said about the product, because I'm having trouble in misunderstanding this category. And he said, Paul, if you saw these women walk in here at 220 pounds, and I make my bonus going to Barbados if I get up to 240 pounds this quarter. And he laughed about it. But they literally knew, don't demoralize the executives of the company, if I show them what their customer looks like as they talk about their most valued customer or targeted customer. Wow. So I got pretty down on the food industry. This is when I started out my research in how we got here because I could see where the needs of was coming from. So I said, surely the cost of this is just unbelievable. The cost of just one disease already, type 2 diabetes, or more than we spend on public education. 
And type di- di- 2 diabetes just destroys families. It makes 55-year-old men and women go blind, have amputations, and have a very, very reduced quality of life on being kind. That's just one side effect of being overweight. So what does the medical industry do? So when I turned my research to the medical industry who has to deal with this problem, I found that the medical industry executives make the food industry executives look like Mary Poppins. The medical industry focuses on what they call a doctor, and they call a doctor a technology dispenser. So you may think of it as your doctor, they think of it as a technology dispenser. They make technology and he dispenses it. The technology dispensers or doctors are targeted by the medical companies, the detail companies, the drug companies, the medical procedure companies, in the same way that the high consumption food customer is targeted. And the medical company people, um, which, oh, well, here's some examples. When I grew up, you got sick and you took a penicillin for six days. And the first thing you asked when you got a prescription is how long do I take it? Today, medical prescriptions in the United States, 95% of the prescriptions filled in the United States are for prescriptions you take for the rest of your life. The doctor says, take this, wait, forever. <laughs> You're not getting better, I don't cure anything. I treat the symptom of your, oh, you want to get better? We can't talk about that. That would be changing your diet or getting rid of obesity. We treat the symptoms of obesity that keep you alive. And the reason for that is just so obvious. If you were a union railroad worker all your life, and you had worked for them, and they trusted you, and they said, we don't trust these guys at the investment banks, we trust you to watch our pension money and invest it so we can have good retirement. Nothing wrong with that. And you had to invest the money. Where were you investing? You invested in companies. Were you invested in companies that made pills that cure disease, they sell for 100 bucks once? Or were you invested in companies that make a pill that cures, treats a symptom of the common cold, doesn't cure it, you take it every day for $3 for the rest of your life? And you can see very quickly how the entire medical establishment is built economically. Nothing wrong, nothing bad, it's just facts. To make products that do not cure anything but treat symptoms. So the three trillion of our economy, that's the medical industry, is basically driven by obesity, heart disease. These are the big factors that consume roughly 90, 95% of our medical budget are directly the symptoms of obesity, and yet obesity is not on the chart to even check as a disease. You have to treat one of the symptoms of hypertension or something else and get them on a drug that they take the rest of their life. And the medical establishment effectively is paid for by governments who have to get through this budgetary cycle or by companies. And why should a company spend money treating something that's absolutely 99% going to cause cancer eight years from now? because you're gonna have this guy on Medicare or on another company, or you'll fire him long before he develops really bad symptoms, such that you don't have to pay for this. I'm not saying this pejoratively like any of these companies are evil, but the effect is the same, and here's the worst example. Suppose for a minute I drew a line down here, I say lock the doors, and on this side of the room, everyone is the CEO of a food company. On this side of the room, everyone is the CEO of a medical supply company, medical procedures, hospitals, uh, pharmaceuticals. And I said, now guys, I want to show you how we're all in this together. First, food companies. Do you recognize food companies that you think you all compete and you hate each other? Wrong. You at Wendy's and you at McDonald's, you don't hate each other. When you get a guy obese, which is 20% over normal body weight, and that average keeps going up, he consumes 50% more calories. So do you see how McDonald's, you're in it, partners with Wendy's and partners with Procter & Gamble, we're all in this together. Let's get the guy drinking more soda. Even if it's not your brand, they'll come around because once they get 20% overweight, they consume at least 50 to 100% more food per day. So that's why at Hamburger, you and McDonald's, you do not make jokes about it. These people, these are your best customers. They take up the same amount of space, same time, and consume twice at the cash register. That's a very valued customer. So food companies, first realize you're all in this together and stop competing so viciously. Our goal is to make America obese so we can double consumption because the population is not doubling anymore. Now, you guys, these guys, you better make friends with the medical. These guys, the medical doctors, when people come in, your goal is to sell more of your medical procedures and get them coming back for more visits and get them addicted to your prescription drugs. Now, you take it out with medical companies. I promise that the new Hippocratic Oath, I will never, ever tell a customer to stop eating. I will never, and ruin our business. I will never, ever tell them to lose weight. I will never tell them to exercise. Now, it sounds crazy. I mean, but in effect, this is what's really going on. 
because the doctor is limited to a 10 year visit, he's got to deal with the prescription, and he doesn't have the time. It's all economic loss. The food industry needs to keep people, making people obese, and their only enemy is if the medical community ever figured it out that the real reason that everyone has all these diseases is the diet and the lack of exercise. Now, I might kind of ridiculous here to talk about this conspiracy, and I ask all the food and medical industry executives to raise your hands and say never work with you know, the patients who lose weight by changing their diet or improving their exercise. Now, could this happen? Of course not. Does it happen? Absolutely. It happens in a conspiracy way greater than as if I could swear them all in the Bible to do this vicious thing I just said. They're all parents themselves. They all have parents themselves who are dying of type 2 diabetes and so many diseases from obesity. But at the same time, the laws of economics, as John Maynard Keynes, my the great mentor of economics, said, every practical person who believes themselves to be a free thinker is really the slave of some defunct economists. And the laws of economics, I knew, were so powerful. So I started doing my research in a way of saying, how much time do we have left? If we're now going to run out of everything, we're going to run out of obesity is going from 50% to 65%. Forget 15%, that's 45 million more people obese. And I started looking at these numbers and I said, how much time left till the whole economy collapses? And that's when I started looking around and I said, wow, it's not that bad. There is a solution. You're a huge part of the solution and it's economics because I knew the laws of economics are so much more powerful than the laws of any government or religion. And the laws of economics dictated this problem. Only the laws of economics could cure it. And I remember how I first stumbled into it. Um, 15 years ago, 15 years ago, I was 45 years old, and I had joined a little mountain bike group in my home in Park City, Utah. And my friends would come over who were about 60. These guys were 60 to 65 years old, all retired CEOs. They'd come to my house, and I'd have breakfast. My wife would make breakfast. And then uh, they would go bike up the mountain. Then after about two hours, my wife would drive me from where we lived at 7,500 feet to where they had biked to at 9,500 feet. I'd get out of the car with the bike and bike the last 500 feet vertical, oh, 100 geez. miles with them. Because I couldn't possibly bike three hours straight uphill, that kind of mountain, the whole ski mountain. And as I'm getting out of the mountain one day, they're, they're waiting for me, it's a little late, I get out of the car, and I'm biking up and they said to me, oh, you're really getting good about this now, you're able to keep up with us on this last last couple miles, and I said, don't make fun of me. I'm 45 years old, you're 65 years old, and you're biking from the very bottom all the way up. I'm just biking the last 500 feet. And my friend Mel said to me, Paul, I'm 65 years old. You think I could bike like that when I was 45? <laughs> 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 he meant it. Like, not a joke. Like, when you get older, you concentrate on your body, and, and you know, again, the thing I was more up with, when you get older, you get less healthy. When you get older, you get more overweight. And I started noticing around me the males of the world. And I started noticing around me, and my wife said, well, you know, Paul, I know you're obsessed, my wife said, with obesity and studying all this, but don't you look how many of our, where are they? You know, she wasn't coming to me in Indianapolis. She's home with the kids, and she's thinking of the life we live in. She said, I'll say it's the life we live in, so everybody's fit. And as they're getting older, they're getting thinner and more fit. And that's when I saw the solution. I saw that there was a subgroup in the population who were getting older and more fit, again, as they age. Like, poor people are overweight because they have money to buy food, and these conundrums started to scream. And as I started focusing on it, I said, wow, there's a new thing going on here. The averages, the totals show 65% overweight and obese. But if you look at the 35% who aren't overweight and obese, there's a subgroup within them that's growing and growing. And that's when I said, it's not just growing in a way that their uh, numbers or total numbers uh, say, say they're happening. It's growing in a way they're getting more fit and more healthy, but we're not counting them. I'm just counting them as non-obese. What I should be counting is they're fit and more healthy. And that's when I saw the emergence of an industry that I later coined the word to be the wellness industry. And the wellness industry was a list of items from the nutritional business from, I would call it, uh, cataract surgery, because your eyes get older, and it's a normal symptom of aging, but the largest operation in the world are cataracts, to fitness clubs and trainers. And my wife said, Paul, you're an academic, you're a college professor, and you have a personal trainer. I mean, you have to think what this would have sounded like 30 years ago. 
Why would a college professor, not a movie star, I have a personal trainer? And of course, to you, that's so standard, but from the world I had come from, it didn't make any sense. So I first had to define the industry. And I define the industry first, as I said, the existing healthcare industry has nothing to do with health. I call it the sickness industry. And the sickness industry are products and services provided reactively to people with existing disease, ranging from a common cold to a cancerous tumor. Sickness industry products treat the symptoms of the disease or hope to eliminate the disease. The wellness industry are products and services provided proactively to healthy people. Proactively, that's you're finding someone healthy. I'm not sick, I'm fine. Let me talk to you about your health. I'm not sick, let me talk to you about your health. To make them feel healthier, to look better, to slow the effects of aging, or to prevent diseases from developing in the first place. In shorthand, the wellness industry are products and services you do, you can consume to keep from becoming a customer of the sickness industry. And the sickness industry, once I defined it, I found out that already by year 2000 was up to $200 billion US. Very substantial growing industry. And I can see that the wellness industry, I'm sorry, the wellness industry is up to 200 billion compared to the sickness industry of 1.5 trillion. And today I'm happy to report to you that the wellness industry worldwide, what you do, is now a $700 billion industry. It's no longer a product. It's not better food or a better way of working out. It's a whole new way of thinking of things, similar to the way when Henry Ford invented the horseless carriage, everyone thought it was a new kind of carriage. Some people said, no, it isn't. It's an automobile. It's going to change the world. People go, can't change the world. It doesn't need pay. How can you drive a car with no gas stations? It needs roads. It doesn't ride on an unpaved area. They are waiting at roads. And they start going, it needs gasoline. I mean, it goes go through the list. And of course, what happened is the auto industry completely changed the way we live. Very similar to the personal computer. When the personal computer came out in 1980, how could a computer be personal? It was the ultimate oxymoron. Computers are these mindless things that you worked in a big room with. And then somebody came out with a personal computer, and why do you need it? And someone says, it's not a personal computer, it's a better calculator for spreadsheets. And you bought a personal computer just for spreadsheets. And then there was another brand of personal computer you bought with Microsoft Word that was just for word processing. It was a better typewriter or electronic typewriter display writer. And some people said, no, this thing is even about processing your words, it's about creating words, communication, and saw that it was going to be a whole new industry, a trillion dollar industry would change the way we live. And we're at the nascent stage right now of the wellness industry not being a better product, but radically changing the way we live. <sighs> now, I have a lot of things I want to throw out to you. So my real goal here today is to give you information that will stimulate your thinking you can apply to your business throughout your conference here this week. And more important, go home and start the research more and start seeing how to apply it. So I'm going to run quickly through the number of concepts of why the wellness industry as I define it today, is at a $700 billion level of an economy that's 15,000 billion, 15 trillion or 0.7 trillion. The sickness industry today is at 3 trillion. Wellness industry is 0.7 trillion. Wellness is growing four times faster than the sickness industry. And soon we're going to be spending our money to prevent someone. You're in a hybrid model because God bless you, you're so out there treating obesity and it brings you to people on the other end, you're also keeping them from becoming obese again. See how they become a wellness customer. Because once they get your body, and you'll soon have both. You'll have customers coming to you because you changed their life and saved their life. And on the other side, you'll have people saying, I'm getting older than I just don't, I want to feel better, I want to be stronger before I get obese and before I get sick, I want to adopt a new product line. So the four reasons for the one trillion trajectory, which we're probably in the next two years of wellness, the first is really the baby bulge in the U.S., and part of this is worldwide. Baby boom, you've heard a lot about. In 1946, people started returning from World War II. We guess all the reasons, but as an economist, I don't tell you the reasons, I'll tell you what the numbers are. And the numbers are that we had a baby bulge. We went from a population of 50 million people born in the 18 years prior to 1946 to 78 million in the next 18 years. And we call that group the baby boom. I'm right in the middle of it you were born from 1946 to 1964. And that bulge in the population defined a lot of consumption. But it's more than just the numbers of the baby boom, because the baby boom at 1946 to 19, uh, 1964, the baby boom population 
Richard now ages 47, 48 to 66 years old, the prime ages that they're focused on your product. It's not just that they're one and a half times the population of the group before and after. Because remember, population is always growing, but in 1964, we went from 50 million to 78 million born for 18 years, then we went back to 50 million, huge drop. And that drop occurred for lots of reasons, from women in the workforce, to the male, we can go through the reasons, but let's just stay with the facts. The bulge in the population is today around 48 years old to 66 years old, that's your prime customer. But it's more than just the numbers of who they are. Because the baby boom generation is the first generation that doesn't accept aging. Whereas they used to say, I wear my hair this way because I'm older. I would never wear that dress because I'm now a mother. I'm on and on, we see that people's whole attitudes have changed. In effect, the baby boom will buy anything that brings them back to their youth. They buy a T-bird today that looks like the T-bird of 1950s. They call it retro. I first discovered it when I was 17 years old and I was driving up from Philadelphia back home to New York. And as I entered the New York airspace for FM radio, I'm listening to my music from high school. And I'm enjoying the music. And then I'm going, oh, that's an old song, you know, three years old. And they came out with a new word called oldies, which are songs my older brother listened to. And it was just absolutely bizarre that what are the young people listening to? But because of the bulge in the population, and as people got older in this baby boom, they wanted the songs that reminded them of their youth. In architecture, in clothes, in three-button suits, we see it everywhere. The baby boom will buy anything that reminds them of their youth. What do you guys sell? Something that reminds them of their youth? Or something that gives them their youth? They really don't know on a mass level. That's why we have 60% of these five, 65% of these and overweight. They really don't know you exist. And if they think it, that they know someone told them you exist, they don't believe it. On a mass level, if they believe it, they would be running <laughs> to any product that would cause them, product, service, training program, that would cause them to actually give them back their youth. Because they're not just accepting, like every generation, that they're getting older. And that's what's primarily driving the wellness industry. These little nascent dots that are occurring. And I say dots, I mean, God bless you, you're, you're approaching a billion dollars in sales in the next year or two. And yet, you're just shifting from being a company and an opportunity to make money to a piece of, God bless you, public policy, to a piece of our society, to part of our government. Because you reach a level that you can affect not tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, but millions of people. From your end, their business and customers, God bless you, as you go out to do what you need to do to support your families. But the beautiful side from my end, sitting on a government and public policy level, is how you're approaching the level now of having something that can massively improve the quality of life, not the quality of the dollars, for starting in America for 204 million people in the United States of 314 million. And that's why it's worth my time being here and studying you, especially as you cross into something large enough in the billions in sales, which translates to millions and millions of customers and what you can do to change their lives. The second reason for wellness growing to $1 trillion, and why wellness is going to surpass the sickness industry, is consumer has an unlimited propensity to consume wellness products and services. That means the consumer doesn't know you exist and doesn't believe you exist. But once they have an experience, because you have changed your appearance, you know it's like you walk in a room, one person lost weight, everyone goes running through the room. I love some of Carl's examples on this. How, so movie stars are in the room, but everyone runs to the person in the group who uh, has just lost weight. And once a consumer develops this wellness mentality, like, wow, someone close to me lost weight, got healthier, looks better, feels better, uh, got rid of type 2 diabetes, not taking insulin. Once that happens, the consumer wants more and more and more. And let me give you an example. It's, it's something I call quantity demand and quality demand. And this is not as relevant to your product today, but very relevant over the next few years, or for those of you who already have mature bases of customers. A quantity demand is the demand for something you just purchased. And let me give you an example. You never had Thai food before. I take you Thai food once. You go, wow, you never had it before. What do you want next week? Thai food. But the best example I use in my life was when I was just graduating college, and I started working at Citibank, and my father took me out to buy my first suit. So I went and bought a suit, $200, they put the suit on me, and it felt real important, and I went and go to work on Monday morning with my suit, and I feel great. Then I notice on Tuesday, when I put on my suit and go to work, everybody else has got a different suit on than me. <laughs> now all of a sudden, I want more quantity, 
I never needed a suit before I started working Citibank, right? Now I want two suits, three suits, and then I want more quantity of the product I didn't even know existed or I wanted before. That's what happens with any new consumer product. You sell them the product, they get to like it, they want more and more and more of it. But does it ever stop? No, it doesn't stop because it's something that American companies generally don't know called quality man. Once I got my $200 suit on, I now have 10 suits. Two years later, I go by the clothing store, and the man says, come on in, Paul, I got this new suit for you. Go away from me. I have 10 suits. I don't need any of your suits. No, just try this new $400 suit on. So I put on the $400 suit just to be nice. I feel great. I buy it. I go to work with my $400 suit on Monday. How do I feel on Tuesday morning putting on the $200 suit? <laughs> <laughs> now, who knows this cold? Japan. Japan. Japan flooded the world's markets in the 60s and 70s with cheap six transistor radios. They made cars like Datsun for the Toyota. Cheap, cheap cars, lots of them. You bought one and you bought a second one. You didn't have one car. A couple got married, now all of a sudden they need two cars because they don't want to argue with it. Then what happens? They figured out that you don't want a third Datsun, so they switched to Lexus, to Infiniti. They literally dropped the whole moniker, the whole brand. And the US kept making Chevy. His father bought a Chevy, his grandfather bought a Chevy, and of course Americans started buying different cars. And you see what happens, a couple buys a car, they buy a Chevy, they, they get some money, they want a second Chevy, so they don't fight over the car, now they want a third car, it's a BMW. And you start to see the shift to quality, it's never stopped, no. And this is the big mistake most companies make. They come up with a product, and they try to get started with a cheaper product. You're up against some of this in your competition. You go and explain wellness, you're almost getting there, someone believes because they know someone else. How much is that? Oh, no, I'm not ready yet. Then they buy a cheaper product. Eventually, they will come back to you. What people don't realize is your best prospect for sale is always the person who said no. It's particularly if they said no for a cheaper product. Because that cheaper product, they buy Thai food the first time they had it, it's $8. They go back to the restaurant, it's $8. They go back again, it's $8. Now, I want to take you to a $50 Thai restaurant. You wouldn't have thought of it before, but now you're in the belief that you like Thai food, you'll buy the higher quality. So what we see is the shift between quantity demand, more of what you already just tried, and quality demand, a higher quality, which starts the whole process all over again. That's how products grow, and that's the biggest mistake entrepreneurs make. They develop a product and they stick with the quality. In the shift between quantity and quality, if you're building something for the long term, not I'm in this for two years and I'm going to retire or I'm getting out of the business, you've always got to stay on the highest quality. But let's be honest, the highest quality means the highest price. It's a euphemism for what we're really saying. It's going to cost more. But you want to be at highest quality because if the product has efficacy, as we know wellness products now do, you've got to be at the highest quality because even the ones who turn you down will come back to you, provided you stay around and let them know they're there, and it also keep your customer from going somewhere else. But the quality is the, is the key story. And that's really what's happening in wellness, is that the wellness industry is growing so fast because of the shift to higher quality products and wellness, which holds the whole industry because they're more efficacious. The third reason wellness is growing is that there really is no limit. I mean, ultimately, what causes wellness? What causes wellness is that every blood cell in my body is 30 uh, days old. And bone marrow is the oldest cells, which are 90 days. And as I age, they get weaker and they reproduce less and my body's aging. So no matter how fit and well you are, once you figure out that you can do something in terms of lifestyle exercise and particularly the right type of food and diet, minerals, vitamins, once you find out that you can actually change the throttle of your aging, it's absolutely no limit. And who wants to slow down their aging more and be more healthy? Those who are already healthy and fit. So you start to see the long-term aspects of your business. You approach a customer, God bless you, because they're sick. They're in the sickness industry. They have a terrible disease called obesity. You change their life and bring them into fitness, but they don't want to stop there because the aging is still going to be there, that at some point they're going to be wanting to spend more and more and more and more higher quality. And that's why I love seeing these you know, nice startup companies in wellness, but they almost don't start a chance because if you don't have the money to invest what your company does in R&D, to develop the new products, the new procedures, the new methods, and constantly go to conferences and learn about them. You don't stand a chance, because you're, as you do stand a chance in our economy, you bring people into wellness and change their lives, but then you lose them as your customer, because they're gonna want a higher quality product. And that's why it's so important to realize that wellness has no limit, because we are always aging and always have a need for more. 
for a wellness product. And the fourth reason that wellness growing is so much, and that's why I love dealing with the Chinese. Um, the premier of China had read one of my books and held it up, talking about the economics of obesity. It's uh, this Chinese economic miracle doesn't stand a chance if we allow the obesity that's starting our cities to continue. And what I like so much about dealing with the Chinese is not only is the leadership fit and healthy, but they see health as something that's critically important to their economy, yes. not just to having happier people. And they also realize that if they had our medical expenses, they would all die of starvation. There'd be no food in the economy whatsoever. So I'm hoping that only by the Chinese, they are killing us and beating us, but not in espionage and not in nuclear arms, but in something that's a really beautiful value of life. Being happy, being healthy. And they're focused very much on it. And I'm hoping very much the US is getting there, and we are getting there very quickly now, because we finally see the very top levels of NIH and of the people who worry about the medical expenses of our country, a recognition that it's much too much treat, cheaper to treat a disease before you get it. If you look at polio, if you look at typhus, if you look at all the diseases of 100 years ago, what do we do? We found ways to keep them. Did we ever cure malaria? No. We found a way to clean up the water from the mosquitoes that caused the malaria. And if you look back, we had the answers 100 years ago. Let's keep people from getting sick in the first place instead of spending a fortune once they're sick. And we're just now coming back to that. So I'm very optimistic because government policymakers really have no choice. I'm seeing a very attentive audience, by the way. I'm going to spend some time now because I'm even seeing a little lift in head when I shift a little from economics to microeconomics and things that may help you specifically in your business, not just the big picture. So I'm going to take a few minutes now and run through why I particularly like the network marketing so much. This is really the business methodology of what you do to God bless you and bring health and wellness to people and change all the paradigm in their lives. And of course, you know, you're a very hybrid company. You can do this as network marketers and you do this on normal distribution of television commercials and shipping the product. So it's a fascinating model. You're clearly focused on the end use consumer. But of the things you do, frankly, I took my time to be here because of network marketing. I love network marketing. And the reason is so many reasons, and I want to run through network marketing and where it fits in the economy. Uh, before doing that, I want to talk a little bit about who succeeds in network marketing and who succeeds in business. One of my favorite areas of economics are millionaires. So when I was a little kid, I just became fascinated by millionaires. My favorite TV show was on in 1957 called The Millionaire. Anyone ever remember that show? Yeah. No, not a few hands. And it was a show shot from the back over the uh, shoulder of the millionaire. So you never saw the millionaire. They always would promise like Charlie and Charlie's angels would yeah. see him. The camera was <laughs> him looking at the world and he would give a million dollars away in each show and watch what happened. And so each show we tuned in, I said, I'm gonna see a millionaire, Dad. They never showed me the millionaire. Mm -hmm. Then I had a favorite comic strip, Little Orphan Annie. And in there was Daddy Warbucks, the millionaire. I shaved my head in the early age. It didn't work. <laughs> was, was a and then I loved restaurants. And my father would always say to me, I said, Dad, let's go out to eat. What do you mean, go out to eat? We went out to eat last week. You know how much that costs? What do you think we are, millionaires? <laughs> millionaires went to restaurants. <laughs> Every time I went out to eat, Dad, where's the millionaire? <laughs> the millionaire. And then, of course, the millionaire went from being a mythical character by the time I got through Citibank to an unbelievable number. In 1990, there were 3.6 million US millionaires. 1995, I was 7.2. 19, uh, 2000, I mean, two, uh, there's 2,000 or 7.2 millionaires. Today there's 10 million millionaire families. That's 25 million people, 2.5 per household, living in a house that the net worth of that family, minus the credit card debt and all their assets, is over a million dollars. That's phenomenal. And yet millionaires are still today the fastest growing minority in the United States. We are increasing millionaires now at a solid million, million and a half people per year, right through this so-called recession. What we're seeing is the most amazing economic conundrum. This is what I spend, frankly, most of my time today is working on unemployment. We live in a world today that the reason Occupy Wall Street was such an interesting phenomenon, why these people protest Wall Street, is everyone in protesting in the park has a brother or sister that works on Wall Street. Mm -hmm. Well, we finally study the millionaires, and I study the Forbes 400 list intensely, because that's a list I didn't create that Forbes magazine in their wisdom says these are the richest people. So I look for patterns and I put them up with my students on charts and figure things out. And what we see is that the people at the top of the Forbes 400 list 
with enormous concentrations of wealth, more than most governments, 50, 60, even billion dollars in a single lifetime. Fascinating. We look at them, almost all of them have a bunch of things in common. Almost nine out of 10 didn't finish or go to college. He's the richest people in the world. And I mean, young people are 40, 50, 60 years old, they see jobs at age. Um, the majority of them come from middle class backgrounds. So they had a single lifetime accumulated wealth. Whereas when the Forbes 400 this started, there were 12 Rockefellers alone, 16 Morgans on the list, because old families had money and wealth. They seem to be disappearing. <laughs> And most important, most of the people on the Forbes 400 list, which is self-made billionaires, have something in common with our last six United States presidents. A degree from Yale, or equivalent, and a brother in jail. From Roger Clinton, Billy Carter, Neil Bush, Donald Nixon, I've worked with some of these people. My job at Jeffrey Times was keep this underneath, away from the press, whatever they were doing lately. And what we see is that the same parents raised someone. So the question I've always asked myself as a teacher of college freshmen for 21 years, I taught a gifted class of freshmen, and I'm fascinated by these people and where they come from. And it used to be if I had a girl at NYU, her brother was in Columbia. Today her brother literally might be in jail or doing something, you know, I call it bad things like our last year presidents. And what I see is the old age question is, the age old question is, is it nature or is it nurture? Is it your genes? that make you successful, or is it your environment? Prior to 1900, we thought it was all genes. Firstborn male has special genes, we gave him title to everything. Guess what, he stayed rich, prove the theory. Mm -hmm. 20th century, it was about environment. It's all your environment, it's not your genes, it's, it's a poor kid is a bad person who should be electrocuted for killing eight people, it's his environment, we should have sympathy for him. Or, he's not really successful and done well, he got all those advantages, environment. Today, I'm finally there to say it's not nature and it's not nurture. It's neither. And what is neither, you guys? It's motivation. In calculus, we talk about success, f of x, is a function of 10% is your genes. I'm not here to tell you that your genes and your intelligence don't matter. 10% of the function of success is your environment. 80% is the choices you make and the motivation. And I can prove that with any successful person by looking at their siblings. And what we see is that in a world where there's so much opportunity, and we live in a world where, look at our president, where he comes from, that anybody can grow up to anything. The decisions you make, your motivation. And for some people, it's they survived a car crash, they had some major epiphany. It can be just waking up and going, all right, I'm fed up. I'm going to do something about my life. Starting with my weight and health. Starting with my business, starting with bringing the weight and health I've discovered that works for me to other people. But I'm going to make a choice. I'm not going to let things happen to me. I'm going to proactively make that choice. And that is so clearly, when you study successful people, the dominant factor. So it's not nature and nurture, it's neither. It's making a choice to do something with your life. And then whatever your genes are, whatever your environment, really don't matter. And you know that whenever you turn the person left or right and say, tell me your story, how you got from here to here, or sadly, went from here to here in life. It's the choices you make that determine almost everything today. And it's a very exciting time to be an economist and be a person who wants to study this, because people can do so many changes, and you really see it empirically. Now, the other items that make network marketing so exciting, now here I'm talking not to your whole company, but just to the network division of your that I respect so much, is first, when I got out of school, and I was doing real well, youngest graduate, top of my class at Wharton, I got hired by Citibank. And people said, Paul's got this loud Brooklyn personality, why is he going to bank? It's the first national Citibank. I didn't join Citibank because I wanted to wear those suits and work with bankers. I joined them because they had the biggest computer in the world. It's called an IBM 37, <laughs> and I was a programmer. And I could program us to do really cool tests and marketing and stuff. And in effect, the unit of technology and economic power in 1976 was a large organization with a big mainframe computer. Because you could use that mainframe to control data and customer data and blow away any local bank or local competitor in anything. So people joined big companies because the technology. Now, of course, what's changed? What's changed is the unit of technology has shifted from the large computer to the individual PC and the handhold PDA. So today, the biggest companies in the world today, the uh, Vodafones, IBM, Apple, what do they make? 
They don't make a single product that can make a child smile when he's unhappy, feed you when you're hungry, clothe you when you're cold. What do they make? They make tools that make individuals so much more productive. And the focus of their tools is you. You're more important as an individual than I work at Citibank. In fact, you see that individual entrepreneurs, by and large, have much better computers and technology because they buy the latest one than the big company that still has an accounting system that says we haven't advertised this over three years. Even though I pay you so much, use the old computer. We've all been there. And so what we see is the unit of technology has shifted to the individual, which is so much stronger. The most fascinating thing I find, though, when people say, uh, maybe you should join my business, you know, you should come into what I do here at Beachbody and you should join it. And you have a debate and they go, well, here are the benefits. I work for this big company and I work for the auto company and I work for the bank and they give me this and this and you weigh it against going into business for yourself. And you're kidding them. Because you're playing along with them because you have to in the debate between being an entrepreneur and going to work for a large company. The real key is you have no choice. There are no jobs left for large companies because they're hiring people like me all the way down every day to eliminate those jobs. And underlying all this is a man who's 103 years old, who won the Nobel Prize for Economics in 1991, one of my mentors. Let me tell you a little bit about Ron Coase. In 1931, Ron Coase was 20 years old, and he had already graduated from London School of Economics, upper-class English person. And in 1931, he won an award from London School of Economics to study something new called entrepreneurship, Horatio Algerism. And he came to, as a coin word, and he came to the United States saying, this is the land of Horatio Alger, of more important, Henry Ford, of Alfred Sloan, of General Electric, Thomas Edison. I'm coming to America where anyone, unlike England, can be anything. I want to know what makes these entrepreneurs work. And when Ron Coase gets here, he was very upset. He says, here I am in America, there's this new depression that just started with the crash on Wall Street, and everyone I meet wants to work for Thomas Edison. They want to work for Henry Ford. They want to work for Alfred Sloan, General Motors. Why? Why don't they want to be him? Don't they realize he's just like them? They, yeah. they can be Andrew Carnegie. They want to work for Andrew Carnegie. And as he studies this, he writes a paper. He's 20 years old, called The Nature of the Firm. The paper wins the Nobel Prize for Economics 61 years later. And the paper, The Nature of Firm, says this. It says, the ultimate efficiency is everybody working for themselves instead of some big organization, The Nature of the Firm. But the problem is transaction costs of finding the employee and telling them what to do exceed the work output. In other words, you want a letter type, to use an example. You can walk out on Wall Street and say, hello, who can type the letter, five dollars. But by the time you find the person you had to type, brought her in, sat her at the computer, tell her the way you like to format the letter, you see the problem. There'd be no way to communicate. It would be 10 times the work of the letter. Instead, hey, why don't you just sit here all day, even though I only need you an hour a day, work here eight hours because you're all trained here. Every time I have a letter, you 